Welcome back to the Cloudcast. I'm your co-host, Brian Gracely, along as always with Aaron Delp. Aaron, how you been, man? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You uh, you look like you are getting ready to to do some things. You're uh, you know, hatted up, t-shirt up. How uh, what, what's yeah. what's on the agenda? Yeah. After after we record this, I, I head off to move one kid out of college, and hopefully we can get that done today. You never know. She's got a ton of shit. And yeah. then the other one graduates college uh, yeah. later this week wow. as well. So amazing. it is amazing a busy, stuff. busy week for me. We. Um, one of the things we, we we spend a lot of time talking about technology on the show. Uh, we do our best to try and frame it in the context of of how people use technology in terms of how they they kind of marry technology with what the business problem is. But we we oftentimes uh, I think we you and I maybe maybe frame this a little bit in the context of like you know vice president and below in terms of like people that are executing things. And we don't necessarily get to dig into kind of the brain of or the mind of what's going on with CIOs because their world is is very complicated. It's very uh, you know they have to both be tactical as as well as strategic. And today we're going to get to uh, to dig into that with somebody who who spends the vast majority of his time uh, with CIOs. So why don't you introduce our guest? Yeah, absolutely. So today we have Tim Crawford, CIO advisor at Avoa. First of all, Tim, is that how you say it? That is how you say it. All right, fantastic. So first of all, we've been friends for years, so it's great to get to talk to you today. And it's it's super fun to pick your brain. I know I've done it periodically on the side a number of times. So thank you for that. But our big topic today, as Brian mentioned, like we're going to really dig into the mind of the CIO. So why don't you give everyone just a quick background of how you became known as the CIO advisor? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. And uh, always great to see both of you. You know, as you mentioned, we've known each other for years now. And so it's been great to kind of see the evolution as we've uh, gone through these conversations. Um, you know, I'm a former CIO myself. I've led IT organizations most of my career. So hands-on roles, operational roles, um, but kind of shifted gears several years ago into one where I started advising other CIOs and kind of working more as a CIO at large. Uh, and then that kind of parlayed into advising uh, enterprise vendors on their strategies and how they're engaging with CIOs. So I still work with that CIO mindset, um, but I'm now applying it in many different ways. Um, and so that's been kind of exciting because I get to see both the inside conversations uh, with other CIOs, kind of that cone of silence, uh, never to see the light of day kind of conversation. And then I also get to see the vendors and, and kind of how they're thinking about it or maybe how they should think about it in some cases. Um, and we get to have, have those chats around where the gaps are. So seeing the buy side and the sell side has been really intriguing. And um, that's been going on now for for several years and and i'm having a blast yeah no we we uh you know as you mentioned we've known you for a long time we 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 run into each other a lot uh whenever there are events um whether they are industry events analyst events uh we've got a chance to to kind of speak a lot about things um I, i'm curious and i know the answer to this is is it's going to depend a little bit but if you if you were to characterize a cio in 2024 what you know what does that what does that person look like where where's their motivations you know do they do they typically come more so from from sort of the technology uh, you know kind of up through the ranks of technology do they tend to be more uh, they came from the business and and they're bringing sort of a business of you know frame of mind to the technology groups what's you know you know kind of put us in the in the headspace of today's modern CIO in terms of what their priorities are, how far ahead of, of things they're thinking, what are their what are their motivations for their career, those types of things. Yeah. You know, and it's changed. It's changed considerably. I mean, just in the last 10 years, um, let alone 20 plus. But um, we still see CIOs that are coming up through the rank and file and become, get promoted up through as CIO. But there's kind of this gap, you know, you mentioned as part of your opener that you tend to focus on the VP and below. And there's this huge gap that goes between the VP and the CIO in terms of the mindset, how they're, how they're engaging, who they're engaging with, what they're focused on, uh, what keeps them up at night. And that's still coming from 
uh, an individual that typically comes up through the IT organization. There was a period of time that we saw uh, individuals, leaders that were coming from other parts of the company, other parts of the business and stepping into the CIO role. And that didn't last too long. Um, every once in a while you'll see it, but it's not common. And the, a lot of the reason for that is because as we all know, and, and I think your audience knows this really well, technology is complicated. And a lot of folks that work outside of IT don't understand, let alone respect that. So having someone that, that leads the organization that IT folks can trust uh, is really, really important. Now, one of the things I will say is that the CIO today has to be a business leader first that happens to have responsibility for technology. So what that means is that you have to think about the, the bigger picture of the company and, and what's important to the company. And technology really becomes not just a support organization, but really becomes the enabler, especially in the last several years where we've seen the importance of technology to our businesses. You can't run a business today without technology. Right, and right. interestingly enough, you also can't switch technology off and run a business manually anymore because um, people have just forgotten the processes. So it's, it is a different mindset. Um, it's a much more elevated mindset and the CIO in the last few years, that role has really kind of risen to prominence in a way we've never seen in the past. And I'm sure we'll talk a little more about that, but, um, those are kind of the, the top line items that, that I think are important to note. Yeah. Yeah. So Tim, let me kind of maybe break that down one step further though, too. We've heard many times CIOs kind of tend to think about two big buckets, right? Like keeping the lights on, the boring side of the business that just keeps everything, maybe I'll call it undifferentiated, right? Operations, mm -hmm. right? And then the innovation side that kind of moves the needle. And I've heard like numbers th thrown around, it's like 65-35 or, you know, 75-25 or, and the CIO's job at a higher level is to minimize the f former and maximize the latter. Is that a... Do you agree with that statement? And how accurate is that? Is that an oversimplification? Yeah, I mean, it is true. There, There is a fundamental requirement that if you can't keep your operations in order, you have no business being able to talk about future state for your organization. I mean, it really does come down to that. So what I do see and in, in what I've done and, and what other CIOs have done in the past is, and what they do today, is you surround yourself with folks uh, within your leadership team that really get the operations and they've got that down. And the more efficient and effective you can be with your operations, the more headspace you have to talk about the more interesting things. Um, and yes, I did say that operations or suggested operations is somewhat uninteresting, but I think more importantly, it's, it's one of those things where it has to be brass tacks it's for organizations. And if you're really struggling to keep the lights on, keep uh, systems up, uh, keep applications running, you've got a real problem, especially today. I realize that IT is, com is complicated, but with all of the tools that exist today, there are a lot of ways that you can kind of minimize the risk or de-risk your operations to be able to stabilize them. That then opens the door to more advanced and mature conversations around where the company is going and how you can use technology in more innovative ways. Um, as to the percentage, it's alongside how mature the thinking of the organization is. And that's not just within IT or the CIO, but it's also how the rest of the organization views the role of IT. So you may have the most innovative CIO, and I've run across folks in this position many times. You've got a great CIO, very forward thinking, very strategic, has their operations you know, in check, but the rest of the organization does not look at IT as a strategic organization. They look at it as kind of a ticket taker, or you're the folks that you know, keep the lights on and focus on the operations. And yeah, we're not going to bring you into those really kind of juicy, interesting uh, conversations. That's changing. It's changing out of necessity, but it's also changing because people are starting to realize that a really good CIO can really deliver differentiation for a company in ways that they've never been able to capitalize in the past. 
And that's a, that's a huge shift. Um, but it does require, as you said, Aaron, it requires you to kind of get your operations in check. And if you can't do that, you got to walk before you run, right? Yeah, no, <clears throat> makes sense. I mean, it's, it's something we talk about all the time, whether it's operations, how you do cloud. I mean, if you don't, if you don't do the fundamentals of it, well, you're, you're going to have all sorts of problems with everything else. You're going to be fighting more complaints and, and other things. Um, I, I want to kind of have you walk us through a little bit of, of maybe what you would advise, but maybe just more so the the CIO mindset, how they would think about a problem. So something mm -hmm. we've talked about a number of times on the show is right now it feels like, and again, this is this may just be a 2024 specific kind of uh, way of, of thinking about things, but but it feels like on one end, because of what's going on with with Broadcom and, and VMware, um, you know, people have talked about you know very large price uh, increases or changes of subscription models. You know, a lot of a lot of sort of uncertainty about that on one end of the spectrum, which would fit more in the you know keep the operations running, do the do the mainstream types of things. And then on the other end, you've got uh, you know various levels of pressure of like, hey, the business could benefit from some of that IT uh, that AI stuff. Walk us through the one end of the spectrum. If you are a, um, you're a CIO and you know, let's just use Broadcom and VMware as an example. We don't have to get into specifics for, for any, you know, any given business, but you know, let's, let's suppose something comes along from a technology perspective and, and all of a sudden it is a significant change in your budget. So in the case of, of, of Broadcom and, and, and VMware, right. uh, you're switching from petrol license to, to subscription license and and maybe it's 3x what it was or 5x or whatever it was it's, or it's significant more. enough that you say i now have to think about how much does this impact the overall budget what what's the thought process that, that you've seen cios go through when a scenario like that happens yeah the, it's and it's a great example um it's been a frustrating one for leaders not just cios but folks within the organization because they've built not just financial structures around VMware, but they've also built organizations around VMware and that expertise. Sure. And when you start to see things happen, like what's happened with Broadcom acquiring VMware and then the license, not just the license shift, I don't think moving from perpetual license to subscription really, really kind of moves the needle in a positive or negative way. But the multiples that Broadcom is now asking folks to pay I mean, two, three X is, is just a start. I've heard even more than that, um, from some organizations. And that's really scary because you don't necessarily have that. So what happens right. is you end up blowing your budget and then you have to backpedal from that. But you also then start looking at, um, exit doors. You start to go, okay, well, if they're going to go two, three X this year, what are they going to do next year? And what about the year after that? And is the value still there? Because there are two pieces that you have to, you have to think about with any product. This isn't specific to VMware, but with any product, you have to think about value and value is, um, an equation that looks at what's your total cost of ownership. What's your total cost to operate that particular product and what are you getting for that? meaning what's the value that your organization benefits from it. And then the second piece is switching costs. And you have to understand, so if I didn't see the value there, what's the alternative? And what would it take to be able to move to that alternative? So there are two pieces to the switching costs, right? What is the alternative and what are the options? Unfortunately, we've seen uh, the demise in this space over the last several years where you used to have some really good alternatives, you know, KVM, Hyper-V, um, Nutanix had their hypervisor as well. And there were tools that would allow you to, to move across. I mean, a lot of that has kind of fallen by the wayside and, and VMware just kind of was the, the last stalwart. And I think from a business standpoint, you know, which is the other piece of perspective is What's Broadcom's move here? I mean, this is a big chess game. In a, in a major way, this is a chess game. And so if you can start to understand what their motivations are, you can start to understand, okay, do, does that align with what you're trying to do and what you need to do for your organization or not? And so I saw this coming years ago. I think many CIOs saw this coming years ago as soon as the intent to acquire VMware uh, was put on the table that we knew how this was going to play out. And I think some folks are kind of shell-shocked 
to, to actually see it play out and going, wow, can't believe that they're doing this. But guess what? This has been done over decades, meaning other companies have done the same exact thing over decades. And what you end up seeing is this bleed of um, customers off of the platform because the value isn't there and the switching costs start to come down because the value isn't there. So it makes it easier to switch and more valuable to switch. Um, there's a lot of conversation happening right now around, okay, what's my alternative? Can I use uh, some of the more advanced tools that are on the market today to move those workloads to private cloud or to public cloud or to an alternative platform? Or maybe, you know what, it's time to rip the Band-Aid off and get rid of this older bespoke application and move to a SaaS-based offering. Uh, that's an alternative. And maybe we get 80% uh, of the um, the usefulness of it. But that's compared with the alternative and the costs associated with it. The problem, you know, on the whole, if we kind of back away from this and look at it from a macro level, the problem that you have from a CIO perspective is it becomes a huge time sink. Because now all of a sudden, instead of going through a normal cycle of evaluating your portfolio, determining how you're going to move and planning that out, now your hand is kind of forced because your CFO is coming at you going, whoa, hold on a sec. You know, when I, when I had my budget, uh, operational IT budget, VMware was one of the top two line items beyond people. So people was obviously the biggest. And then VMware licensing was often one of the top two. And so it was always a conversation with my finance team around, okay, so are we getting the value there and, and where do we go, et cetera. That unfortunately is front and center for CIOs today. They have to figure out, okay, are we going to suck it up and blow our budget and know that that's, that's where we're stuck, uh, for a period of time, or is the value still there? I mean, it's entirely possible that, you know what? 2x, 3x, yeah, it's still valuable to stay with VMware. Um, I don't want to say that it's all negative, but for a lot of folks, there's a huge sticker shock that's causing them to look for the exit doors as quickly as they can because not just what's happening today, but what's going to happen next year and the year after. Um, and so they're, they're looking at those alternatives. It just becomes a big distraction at this point. Um, yeah. I think once, yeah. once we kind of have a plan, then uh, then we can move our, our focus elsewhere. Yeah, we, Aaron, and Aaron and I have talked about that this feels like a 12-month a 12, 12 sort of situation that, that one way or other will, will work itself out. You'll either, you'll either stick with it or you'll make a change, but yeah, it, it feels like a, a 12, maybe 18-month phenomenon. It does. Yeah. But the other thing, Brian, is if you look at <clears throat> it from Broadcom's perspective, so imagine you're... You're Hawk Tan, and you're you're sitting in the the driver's seat, and um, you know that the switching costs for VMware are really really high. The and there isn't a real good alternative. You kind of have a captive audience, right? Oh yeah. And yeah, so the, capitalize on that investment playing. as much as you can, mm -hmm. and take advantage of that for your shareholders. So I get it. I totally get it, but unfortunately, it's leaving a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, um, and I think that's going to have some significant brand erosion for both Broadcom and VMware. Yeah, and and Tim, I want to I want to get your thoughts on AI, but before I do, I wanted to kind of relate the VMware thing to a conversation I had with actually a CIO in my day job, and it was interesting, like. The, the biggest takeaway they had, they were kind of advising, you know, technical sales and marketing people, like, how do you get in our mindset kind of thing? And it was, it was interesting to say, they're like, look, I don't buy products. I don't care what products they are. I just simply buy a solution and I have a budget with a whole bunch of buckets and line items. And I, each of those solutions, you know, there's a line item in it. So they're like, don't try and sell the product, you know, sell the solution, but also make sure what bucket are you fitting in? Are you fitting in that keep the lights on bucket? Are you fitting in that innovation bucket? Are you rarely crossing both? And like, how do you target buckets and, and budgets? And is that a way to kind of good way to think about this? It from yeah. a, like you're talking about VMware and alternatives, right? Yeah. And 
I used to do something very similar with my budget and I've, um, I've actually presented on this with other CIOs around financial management. Financial management is something that has kind of become in vogue in the last year, which is kind of weird to me because I mean, this is, <laughs> it should be table stakes, uh, for most it organizations, but wasn't necessarily, it was some organizations sadly were kind of fly by the seat of their pants, you know, oh, it's budget time. Let's throw together a spreadsheet and do the, the minimum required and as much as we know, and we'll, we'll just kind of wing it. Um, whereas others are much more sophisticated in the way that they manage their finances and can project out multiple years. And that's exactly what we did. Um, so within an annual budget and we had a multi-year budget that went with it, but within our annual budget, I kind of broke things down into two, two categories. I had my operational category, which was the keep the lights on. And then I had what I called discretionary and discretionary was anything net new. So anything new or any change to the operational. And the reason I did this was early in my career, I realized very clearly that high dollar value items, like I mentioned, you know, VMware, Oracle was another one that, um, you know, was a big license item, but they would get the attention. However, what you want to bring the attention to is not the things that keep the lights on. You want to bring the attention to the things that are variable, the things that change year to year. And so for financial folks, they want to know kind of what's the steady eddy, what's the minimum to keep the lights on and keep things going. And then they want to know, okay, so how's that variable piece uh, taking place over the course of each year? You know, am I looking at 20% increase year one and 50 year two and nothing year three and 75 year four? I mean, what's, how does that play out? And so by breaking it up between an operational component which is pretty standard, pretty even year over year. You know, you're going to have some increases for support and maintenance, and you're also going to have some changes that you're going to have to do that are part of the standard operational requirements. But then what it does is it brings the focus to those discretional projects and those discretional projects. And, you know, maybe discretional was not the right word to use, but it, it at least brought the right attention to the right place where we could say, look, we're going to spend half a million dollars on this particular project in discretional. And here's the outcome that comes with it. And so then you can tie that to a particular business outcome that, that might have other parts of your organization involved. Um, but the point is it got you away from just looking at the big ticket items and focused on those things that, that really are uh, flexible and really kind of give you the ability to kind of, um, ebb and flow with your, with your spend for the year. Uh, but yeah, so the, so I do see that more common, uh, as we go through time, but, um, yeah, it's, it's important to understand kind of your finances, even if you're, you're not putting together a five-year it budget or it strategy as most people aren't anymore because so much changes just in years two to three you still have to understand how you're spending and what the purposes of that spending is. And if you can help categorize that, um, the other thing is don't try and bury costs where you say, Ooh, I've got this little pet project. Let me dump it in, you know, in some bucket with operational to try and get it across the finish line. The very first time you get caught doing that, your credibility goes to zero and you will never yeah. ever be able to get that back. So be honest, be transparent about it, be candid about it. You're all on the same team. You're all trying to work toward the same goals. And I think that's a way just to also bring the focus of the conversation to the things that really matter. Yeah. I, I want to, I want to come back to sort of the flip side of that, that question that I asked you earlier about, you know, that, that spectrum where infrastructure is on one side and, and now at least, at least this year, and maybe for a couple of years, AI will will be on the side of, of innovation and, and, and doing new things. How are you seeing, I mean, AI is one of those things that, as we've talked about on this show, you know, every day is a new headline. Um, it's a, it's a new area for a lot of people. And so you're trying to figure out like what's real, what's not real, what's important. How are you seeing CIOs kind of just make sense of it, figure out 
how to prioritize things? Is there a lot of back channeling going on right now between you know your your CIO community saying like, hey, what are you trying? What's working for you? You know, what's what's real? What's the kind of what's the temperature uh, for them with with AI? Because I, I imagine, you know, and you know this from the early cloud days as well. Lots of people are coming back from events. Lots of people are reading you know news articles and they're going, hey, why can't we have some of that? whatever that magic is. Um, but it's, but it's, you know, right now it's, it's, it's still a lot of, uh, undetermined types of things. Yeah. And, you know, we just like in the early days of cloud, I mean, we're also seeing the AI washing, you know, now improved with AI, sure. you know, right, right, um, right. you know, and, and realistically it's not AI, it's gen AI that, that people are talking about. AI has been around since the sixties. Um, right. gen AI has been around about 18 months now. Yeah. There, you know, it, it came up again in conversation last week um, amongst a amongst a group of us, and the challenge is how much do you spend specifically for AI efforts or AI projects? Kind of tying it back to the budget, and there were some real questions of, well, what is AI? Like, what? How do I? How do I do? How do I kind of break that out individually? Now, if I kind of back away from what it is for just a minute, talk about it at a macro level, what some of the early uh, experimentation showed us is that you have to have some some pretty significant chutzpah to to be able to um, get your arms around AI. You know, some folks were trying to build their own LLMs and and train those, and and it was it was the wild wild west. I mean, it kind of is today still. However, we're starting to see more and more folks just kind of back away or not even go down that path and say, look, we need a better way to manage this. And so you're seeing things like model selection around some of the general purpose uh, models, whether it's Llama or Dolly or, or Gemini um, or Titan. Uh, and then I want to consume that through existing tools from one of the hypervisors. So, you know, Google and Amazon both have really good tool sets that allow you to tap into that. So you don't have to kind of roll your own. Enterprises are looking to um, find ways to consume this through the existing enterprise applications that they're already running. So instead of trying to figure out how to use this technology and bolt it on to my enterprise application, and hopefully I've got the right guardrails in place, and hopefully I'm not bringing additional risk uh, into the equation more so than the opportunity, if I can just use the generative AI technology that my enterprise vendor, whether it's a Salesforce or uh, SAP, are bringing into the technology, that's actually really attractive because now I don't have to build that organizational um, that organizational expertise around this technology, but rather I can step back and say, okay, how are we going to use it in a meaningful way within our company to benefit our customers, to benefit our employees, to benefit the efficiency of our operations and supply chain? Those are the areas that I'm seeing a market shift to. And so then it becomes hard, like how much money are you spending to do that? Um, and that gets a little muddled because it's baked into the technology itself. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. It makes sense. So, hey, uh, we're about at time. I wanted to one last topic, and this is more like, hey, what did this look like? You were in New York City recently, I think, and and it was HashiCorp yep. invited you for the ringing of the bell. And then big announcement, big splash, ringing the bell, lots of great things. And then less than 24 hours they got bought. Um, yeah, for, <laughs> actually, forty-eight hours. Tell, but forty-eight yeah. hours. So tell let, everyone what that's like. What, what? Oh my gosh, that was that was it was it's a little just kind wild. Of a fun story. You know, the, I I've really kind of gotten to know the HashiCorp team, and it's a great team of folks. Um, and some of the folks there, you know, we've uh, Jay Fry, who you know we've known for for years in the cloud space. Uh, you know, he's part of the core team there. But yeah, so they invited me to join them for the ringing of the opening bell at the NASDAQ market site on Monday last week. And uh, it was great. It was a great experience. I had been to the New York Stock Exchange before. I had not been kind of behind the ropes, uh, so to speak, uh, at the NASDAQ, which is kind of cool. 
Um, although you can see it all because they're right there on Times Square and it's a big glass wall. It's not not as opaque as marble walls uh, at the New York Stock Exchange. But it was just really cool um, to kind of share that moment with the HashiCorp team. And so, of course, they had not just the executive team, but they had a whole cadre of employees and they had customers there, too. Um, so it was a lot of fun to to see them all kind of celebrate and, and have some fun with the, the opening bell on Monday morning. So that's Monday morning. Monday afternoon, they announced their infrastructure cloud offering, which is a way to kind of accelerate the onboarding and use and, and broaden out the use of HashiCorp technology. So that's Monday afternoon. Tuesday morning, the Wall Street Journal runs an article um, around a rumor that IBM is is gunning to acquire HashiCorp. And so that started a whole news cycle because of course I'm at the NASDAQ market site. So I'm posting on social media, hey, this is really cool. I'm spending time with these folks. Um, and so everybody's like, ooh, Tim's on the ground. Let's go, <laughs> let's go talk to Tim. <laughs> so it started a whole media cycle where I was getting a ton of inquiries from media and different companies asking, okay, what is this? What does it mean? You know, do you think it's true? You know, this, that, and the other thing. That was Tuesday. So I go to dinner Tuesday night, Wednesday, I'm working through meetings and I'm supposed to go to a dinner. It was actually the Wall Street Journal CIO network dinner uh, Wednesday night with the Wall Street Journal CIO uh, journal team. And at four o'clock, I think it was four o'clock Eastern, the press release hits that IBM is definitely intent on acquiring HashiCorp. So now it's gone from a rumor to actual news, real news. So that started the media cycle all over again. So the news cycle starts over, I get the same inquiries. Okay, now that it's official, what do you really think? Um, and I had written up uh, a brief post Tuesday night because I'm like, gosh, there's, there's a lot more to this that people need to be thinking about. And then of course, Wednesday, it became official. And then the onslaught of briefings. And then Thursday, I flew to uh, San Francisco and by Friday, I was on briefings with the IBM and HashiCorp team kind of outlining, you know, how that's going to play out and what they're, how they're thinking this will, this will kind of work. Cause there are questions around, well, where does HashiCorp kind of fit in with IBM cloud and with Red Hat and how does Terraform kind of fit in with Ansible and, and, you know, talking about day zero and day one and day two and, and the rest. And so there are a lot of questions, but. God, what a wild week. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just a it, just a series of of kind of things and it it all spun off I think because I was so public about my uh my participating in the opening bell at the Nasdaq, which was again, that was just really cool and I'm really grateful to uh that they invited me to to join them for that. Good stuff. Good stuff. It's sort of like the like the guy who took that picture when uh when Sully put the plane down in the uh in the in the ocean and or not in the ocean in the, in river, the Hudson in, the, in New York he didn't didn't know what he was getting himself into but now all of a sudden you're 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 not only in the middle of the story you're part of the story so yeah. <laughs> good stuff good stuff well listen Tim yeah. I know you're a busy man uh, we appreciate the time today um, if folks uh, CIOs or you know future future plan to be CIOs want to get in touch with you pick your brain what's what's the best way to uh, to engage with you or just reach out to you. Yeah, best best way is um, definitely check out the website, avoa.com, um, and you can get to all the different things, whether it's the podcast, CIO in the know, CXO in the know, which are going to have new episodes here in short order. So a little announcement there. And then there's a newsletter on LinkedIn, uh, and then you can connect with me uh, through LinkedIn and follow me on X or Twitter, or whatever we're calling it today. Good stuff. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. But well, thanks listen, again, man, it guys. Was... It's, it's great to see you and, and yeah. uh, honored to, get... to be a repeat guest on the show. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and hopefully we get to see you again in, in person sometime soon here. Aaron, you want to uh, wrap, it up, wrap us up and take us home? Yeah, absolutely. So on behalf of Tim and Brian and myself, everyone out there, thank you very much for listening. We certainly appreciate it. And if you enjoy the show, please, if you can leave a review wherever you get your podcasts or certainly tell a friend as well. And so for that, I'm going to wrap it up for this week and we will talk to everyone next week.